Welcome to the Tuesday edition of Wands World. And I made a vague promise that I might do some cooking today, but uh, my cooking has been <laughs> very plain. And in fact, today I made um, macaroni with a bolognese sauce, <laughs> which I'm sure everyone can make. So I'm going to talk about public education today because I want to talk about education in general and public education comes up as my first point of contact with the sort of generalized question I guess you could say is like why do we need education at all. Because there's a lot of people that I hear going on and on either on YouTube or um, uh, Facebook or other social media saying, oh, the problem in the United States or England or wherever, the problem is that we don't have enough education and so we are <laughs> electing leaders who are not helping the country but helping themselves and if only the electorate were better educated then we wouldn't get these leaders. Well I happen to not agree with that. I think that even with more education people would still vote with their feelings rather than with logic and that's going to be one of my subjects at some point. But for now, I want to look at the nature of public education because it's one of those areas where people are divided. Now, should we have public education? Public education meaning education that is free for everybody and is paid for through taxation. There's an awful lot of people who say, I don't want my taxes going to educate other people's children. Old people say, well, I had children decades ago, they finished school a long time ago, have jobs and so forth, and so why should I pay these taxes? Some people say, I don't have children at all, why should I pay these taxes? As it happens, I had one son and I educated him at home. So you could make the argument that I shouldn't have to pay school taxes because I was the one doing all the schooling, paying for books and equipment and uh, uh, computer apps and so forth. That why should I have to pay tax as well? And I have an answer to that question, so stay tuned. Now, I'd like to begin by talking a little bit about the evolution of education, and because I can't do it globally, I'm, you know, I, I've certainly experienced education all over the world. I've been to school in England, in Australia, I've been to university in England and the United States. I've taught at university in the United States, in China, in Cambodia, and I've also taught in secondary schools in Myanmar and Italy. And almost all of those have been 
public schools, state-funded schools. Not all. Uh, the school in uh, Myanmar was a private school, and I also taught at a private school in China for a little while. But the vast majority have been public schools, and I attended only state schools for all of my education from infant school to PhD. So I want to get into the history a little bit to understand why we have public education at all. Now before the 19th century, there really wasn't any public education. In fact, in England there wasn't any state-funded education until the 1880s. Before that, all education was fee-paying, and that went back a very, very long way, back into the Middle Ages. And before the 1880s, what were known as public schools in England <laughs> weren't state schools. They were fee-paying schools, but they were public in the sense that boys, because girls didn't go to school, boys came to these schools from all over the country. And they went to one or other school based on its, perhaps, reputation. Um, schools like Eton, Harrow, Rugby School were, were all public in the sense that the, the boys had to live in them because they came from so far away and so many diverse um, areas of England. Uh, they boarded at the school, usually from the age of about 11 until about 18. And so they were public schools as opposed to what were called private schools, which were small schools operated locally and you could attend them by living at home and going to the school during the day, just like we do in the majority of state schools now. So, the, But the public schools, because they drew students from such a wide area, had to be boarding schools. And that, that was your choice. There were some private secondary schools, and there were also a number of schools run by the church. But they were all fee paying. So if you didn't have the money to send your children to school, they didn't get educated. And for most of the history of England, uh, we'll take as our example for now, the majority of people couldn't even read and write because they never went to school. And for centuries, it really didn't matter. <laughs> um, there was a time when very few people could read and write. Um, we're talking about way back now, but in the Middle Ages, uh, a lot of the nobility couldn't read or write. It wasn't important. <laughs> it's more important to be able to hold a sword and go into battle. and all those kinds of things, and they had scribes who did all the uh, accounting and academic work for them. Uh, but up to the 19th century, it was considered not important to have the majority of people being able to do more than basic counting for buying and selling, which is very rudimentary. And they didn't need to read or write. Well, then the Industrial Revolution hit. Now, the Industrial Revolution required a number of changes in culture. One of them was a massive move of people from the countryside to the cities. And this happened because with 
more and more farms being mechanized um, with threshing machines and tractors and so forth, the need for manual labor got smaller and smaller. And so people migrated to the cities where there were factories and also to areas such as the north where there were coal mines where they could find work either you know, in the mines, in factories, or in some urban um, industries. And the change was phenomenal. At the beginning of the 19th century, 80% of the population of England lived in the countryside and 20% lived in cities. By the beginning of the 20th century, it was the exact reverse. 20% lived in the country and 80% lived in the cities. And that massive crowding of cities led to slums and a great deal of urban poverty and all the rest of it that we know about because it's still with us. Now, the Industrial Revolution needed masses of labor, but it also needed educated people because the Industrial Revolution had been founded on the Scientific Revolution. Now, obviously, they needed, among other things, unskilled laborers for all kinds of things. But there were many jobs that were skilled jobs, required educated people. So they couldn't have people going to the factories who didn't know how to read and write and calculate and so forth. So around the 1880s, there were, there were actually two movements that were working side by side. One of them was a movement to get rid of child labor. Because at the beginning of the Industrial Revolution, children as young as three and four years old were put to work. They could be um, put up chimneys to sweep chimneys. They would put down coal mines, uh, doing all kinds of jobs, uh, working in the, in the fields. And th their conditions were very harsh, and a number of social reformers working to abolish child labor. And that coupled with the increasing need of the Industrial Revolution to have a minimally educated workforce uh, led the push for public education. So in the 1880s, it became mandatory for all children to go to school from the ages of five to 10. And during that time, they would learn how to read and write, and how to calculate, known as the three R's, like reading, writing, arithmetic. And that system actually persisted well into the 1950s in many areas. Not in England. By, I think by the 1950s, the school leaving age was 14, and it was beginning to creep up in that direction in Australia also, but I think at the beginning of the decade, the school leaving age was 11. That is the difference between primary education and secondary education. The primary from about the age of five to about the age of 11, and then secondary education from 11 or 12, roughly up to 18. That that split between primary and secondary is extremely old. And secondary education was considered, even in the 1950s, to be a kind of frivolous extra for most people who wanted to go into trades. So what happened was, at the age of 11, armed with their ability to read and write and calculate, most children, and certainly boys, were sent off into apprenticeships 
and they would spend from 11 to 16, roughly the secondary years, instead of going to school from 11 to 16, they would take an apprenticeship, and that would mean that they had to learn all there was about this particular craft that they were interested in. It could be plumbing, or painting, or cooking, any number of apprenticeships. They, they earned very little, but they learned their craft so that by the age of 16 they could become master craftsmen like a master plumber or a master painter, um, and could then set up shop by themselves. Whereas people who are more inclined to go into, um, let's say, secretarial work or uh, business or go to university would stay on at secondary school from 11, to 18. Now, this is the complicated part and where I'll leave things for today and come back and talk more about them Friday, is that um, there are disadvantages to that old system of most students getting a primary education and then leaving and somehow or other training within the workforce and a select few going on to do subjects that they didn't learn in um, primary school, the sciences. Um, they might have done some history in primary school, but they do a lot more geography. Um, they probably also did a little bit of English literature, but they would do much more of that in secondary school. And languages, um, the majority of uh, the public schools, in fact, did mostly Latin and Greek for those seven years of secondary school. And still Latin and some other language would be common in secondary school. And the question that arises, and still arises, is why do we need to learn these things? <laughs> that, I mean, that's my really crucial question. You get to high school mathematics, and you have to start learning trigonometry and some forms of geometry and so forth, algebra, and, and students want to know, and I used to be a mathematics teacher, so I know that students do want to know, why do I have to solve quadratic equations? Why do I need to know this? And in practical terms, you don't. I don't believe you know, I'm 69 years old. I've got a very solid mathematical background. I've taught mathematics. I've written papers and even books that involve mathematics. I've never had to use a quadratic equation, ever. <laughs> so you could say, well, it's useless. But it's not useless because algebra geometry, trigonometry, are all about mathematical reasoning. And you'll recall in a previous video that I talked about mathematical reasoning. It's not the be-all and end-all of logic, but it is an important component. And that solving quadratic equations is part of training your critical thinking mathematically so that you learn logical thinking. That's the point. The, the, the precise details of what you're learning are much less important than the fact that you're learning how to manipulate mathematical logic. So, ditto other subjects. Um, why do I have to learn history? Why do I have to learn geography? 
Why do I have to study 18th century poetry? Why do I have to study French? Why do I have to study Latin? Well, for the great bulk of people, those studies are not especially useful. And the problem is that over the course of the 20th century into the 21st century, certain curricula have become standardized or normalized as being beneficial without anybody really understanding why they are beneficial. Why should everybody study these subjects in this way? And the directives are being given by politicians in, who in many cases don't understand education and <laughs> many of them were not very good in school and therefore don't really know why education, like with a capital E, you know, like why education is important. And that's where I want to lead us, is like, why is education important? And how could public education be better than it is? Well, those are questions that I want to leave until Friday. And meanwhile, please like and subscribe, and I will find you at the end of the week.